Uh, welcome everybody um, to the first talk. Um, I'm, my name is Thomas Heller. I um, will give a presentation about, well, um, the abstract said massive parallelism in C++. Um, after I w I've done half of my slides, I um, saw that I used up, well, about 40 slides or something. So um, the, the main reason is I didn't really know which audience to expect and given the sheer amount now, um, I'm even more confused. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, <laughs> I'm massively confused, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so let's start. So um, why parallelism? So um, well, most of you might have heard the term, um, the free lunch is over, right? So um, I'd say parallelism is everywhere, right? So my question to you, um, who of you actually does multi-threaded programming? Okay, almost everybody, that's nice. Um, who of you um, uses more than um, two cores? Four? Eight? <laughs> Cuda doesn't count <laughs> yet. Um, 16? Still? 32? Okay. Well, anything you, you want to run on, right? I mean, um, if you if you if you have a car, a car has lots of cores, right? Yeah, that's that's also um, one of the points I want to make, though. Um, so, okay, you're all experienced. So, how many of you actually um, uses the C plus plus eleven um, stuff? So you all will be very very bored. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, anyway, so uh, my, my motivation is that, well, yeah, parallelism is everywhere, as you all know. Um, so, um, scaling the frequency of a single core obviously um, doesn't fit the power budget anymore, and increasing the complexity of a single core for architectural improvements um, isn't going to cut it either. So, instead of making a single core faster, we just add more cores, right? So, you mentioned CUDA, perfect example, right? Um, lots of cores, but um, depending on how you count, right, and how you look at it. <laughs> okay, um, more like 64, right? <laughs> okay, so um, if you have any questions, so um, the, the first half will be um, very basic stuff, I guess, for you, since you all know, know it. Um, but we have a flip chart here, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so, um, right. So, parallelism is everywhere. Who, who would agree that embedded devices are increasingly more and more parallel? Excellent. So, my talk is basically over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, right, um, I listed, well, intelligent sensors and actors, right? Um, the whole inter Internet of Things thingy, smartphones, obviously, um, and gaming devices like um, PlayStation or Nintendo devices, depending on how you count, right, whether it's embedded or not. Um, I'd say it's kind of embedded. Um, some people might disagree there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nintendo has a, has a, a GPU on it. An X, you know, the Jetson X1. Sure. Um, yeah, um, just because you have a GPU on it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't have to be embedded, right? No, no, but it's an embedded. This is an embedded. It, it this is a system on a chip. This right. is a custom version no, of the X1. No, the, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, um, and of course, your personal computer, right? Um, lots of cores, increasing core counts, um, et cetera. And server systems, right? So, um, when we talk about parallelism, um, who of you just thinks about multi-threaded programming? Only one? <laughs> okay, so I mean, um, what else is there, right? We, we also have, well, accelerators, right? Um, we also have distributed computing, right? Um, where probably 
<laughs> most of the parallelism is, I guess. Right. Well, <laughs> you disagree? Yeah, but no, no, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt. Okay, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Um, I mean, um, it's very hard to estimate the, the uh, scale of the um, cloud centers, of the data centers, right? Um, so one estimate um, about the Google um, scale is about 2.5 million servers, something. Um, How many processes are distributed across 2.5 million <coughs> servers? How many? Yeah, that's hard to tell, right? Um, no. But um, the idea is that you are able to scale out very largely. That's the idea. Okay. And um, to some degree, um, I'd argue that um, the big companies kind of do it right with the um, user base they serve and um, all this stuff. So um, another big topic in distributed computing is um, supercomputers. That's um, where I kind of come from, um, where we are in the range um, between, um, well, in the, in the, in the, 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 the five fastest machines have um, between 300,000 cores and um, almost 20 million cores, right? Um, so um, those run mostly very tightly coupled um, applications and um, the average number of cores, hmm? It's the massive number. <laughs> hmm? The accuracy for the, the, the dot two. <laughs> 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 well, it's an average, right? <laughs> 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 um, I just I just um, um, summed up all the uh, all the core numbers and divided by 500, right? And so the average number is um, 140,000, right? Um, no, Titan is uh, 18,000 cores. Uh, the rest are Tesla T points. As you just told me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in a similar fashion, you might want to count the, the Tauri light differently and Pistain um, the same, right? So it all depends. Um, hmm? With one million cores, I wouldn't mind a few more or less. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the challenge here is that um, not all cores are the same, right? Um, so. Um, um, the question was, um, with, with that many cores, I don't care if it's, 10, 000, uh, if it's a thousand more or less, right? Um, but um, the thing here is that not all cores are equal, right? So um, we have, so um, uh, those two systems are heterogeneous systems with um, GPU accelerators in them. Um, this one here is um, also heterogeneous with a um, x86 host processor and a custom um, Japanese built um, many core CPU and the um, well this is a homogeneous one actually anyways um, right so um, yeah I just want to make a point that parallelism is everywhere so um, also another thing I want to um, I want to highlight is the difference between parallelism and concurrency right so um, there is kind of a difference. So um, to explain the difference and to have some, some example that we, we are going to walk through is um, we have a waiter in a restaurant that's preparing a meal and a drink for some, some customer, right? So um, the tasks are um, to accept an order, prepare the drink, prepare <coughs> the meal, and serve it, right? So um, sequentially, what you, what you want to do is um, yeah, you, you take the order, prepare the drink, prepare the meal, serve. Um, when a new order comes in, right, um, you have to wait until um, the um, waiter is free again to take the order, right? Um, we can do this more or less concurrently and, well, kind of interleave the, the different operations. So um, we, we take um, the next order concurrently while um, the first order is already in place. So um, you can think that um, while the waiter prepares the meal, so he just has to press a button on the on the microwave oven, 
and he just has to wait for two minutes so he can get back to the desk and um, take the next order, right? So as, as um, a very hand-wavy mental model, right? Um, and parallel execution, on the other hand, is that you really have um, just two waiters, right? So you can actually um, execute or execute the order in parallel. Okay. <laughs> so um, oftentimes concurrency and parallelism is kind of mixed and matched together. Um, and um, one thing I want you I want you to take home is actually that um, the stuff um, that is in the C++ standard and that's or well more like the stuff that's going to be hopefully soon in the C++ standard is actually um, really trying to converge those those two terms um, eventually, right? Anyways, um, yeah, drink. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, in other words, if you have sequential execution, everything's nice, right? Um, but if you want to do stuff in parallel, well, it's getting ugly. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, the next point on the agenda is trying to actually um, define an API such that um, we have a better chance of avoiding um, those situations, right? So, um, for that purpose, um, I want you. Um, I want to repeat what what C++ pro provides. Um, how it can be improved, probably, maybe, and um, more. <laughs> Let's see. So yeah. So parallelism and the C++ standard, right? So. Um, Starting with C++11, it was actually not undefined behavior um, when you run multiple threads in a C++ program, right? So um, the um, biggest thing that was needed for this was actually the, the memory model, right? Which defines um, things like um, um, sequencing and happens before and happens after and um, a correct uh, a C++ program doesn't have any data races. Okay. How many of those are there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a C++ program doesn't have any data races because data races are... Uh, so how many, how many um, C++ programs are there that don't have any data races? Okay, so um, <laughs> the point is that data races are explicitly undefined behavior, right? And for that reason a C++ program doesn't have any data races, right? By definition. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but funny, funny enough, um, the standard actually um, defines data races just to say that data races are undefined behavior, right? <laughs> Which is totally clever. Um, but, yeah. Um, as you all know, um, not having undefined behavior in any non-trivial program, um, even if it's single-threaded, is kind of hard, right? Um, almost impossible. So, um, yeah, so we have the memory model, which is actually um, matching to the um, C memory model, um, which is kind of nice. So they, they really um, tried to um, define something that's compatible with the um, mother language, so to say. Um, right, and in order to to deal with parallel programs, um, you have um, all those nice headers. So I just listed the includes for the different sections where you have the um, support for atomic operations, um, the support for um, synchronization primitives in the mutex and condition variable header, and support for um, <coughs> threads and future, okay? So 
To repeat the question, how many of you use Atomics? <laughs> ah, come on, really? Okay, mutex, probably. Okay, condition variable. Okay, threat. Future. So now, now I really have to ask if you, you said you used the C++11 stuff and, and almost everybody said, yeah, um, we do multi-threading, so what do you actually use? Cute? Cute? Libraries. Libraries? <coughs> I mean... DBP. Okay. OpenMP. Open, OpenMP. Open okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so, so you're not, not ex exactly using the C++ standard. Then. <laughs> okay. Right, so um, the next new and cool and big thing in um, the C++ standard is the parallel algorithms, right? Which I have very high hopes that it will eventually phase out the need for OpenMP, okay? Um, because it more or less allows you to do anything you can do in OpenMP, um, right? And much more, okay? So um, I'm happier now because um, most of you probably, um, yeah, anyways. Right, so um, the atomics um, define types and functions for atomic memory accesses, as the name says. Um, I won't go into detail um, with respect to this, but um, those are um, essentially needed as the basic building blocks to um, define um, the, um, well, something happens before something else, right? Um, so you need memory fences, um, atomic loads, atomic stores, etc., to to actually um, build something that makes sense in a multi-threaded environment. You don't necessarily have to use the the standard atomics. You can use some some compiler intrinsics, some non-portable thingies. That's fine. Um, but the um, standard atomics are um, there and can be can be used. And the nice thing is that those memory ordering orderings. Um, um, ordering um, integers, enumerations, whatever, are defined in terms of the um, memory model that has been defined priority. So, um, yeah. Right. Then the next thingy, of course, is the um, support for spawning threats, right? Um, and most notably, um, STD thread, right? Um, so um, for this, as um, the basic, the STD, what, what STD thread does is essentially it, it, it's, you can pass it a function, right? A ca uh, or a callable. And what the implementation then does is um, it spawns a new thread of execution, right? And a thread of execution is a sequence <coughs> of instructions that can be executed concurrently with other such sequences in multi-threading environments while sharing a same address space, right? So um, I want you to keep that in the back of your head, right? It, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to launch an operating system thread, okay? <coughs> And of course, um, together with, with um, concurrently running um, threads of executions, you need um, some synchronization primitives in order to um, avoid data races and undefined behavior. Okay, so um, let's get back to our restaurant um, example. So um, we want to parallelize this. Okay, so as a um, to, to have a basic um, basic round, um, let's start with this well very simple um, sequential implementation um, where we have some some kind of while loop where we um, accept the order and um, then prepare the drink, prepare the meal, and sen and then serve um, both right to the customer. So, um, anybody disagrees or has questions regarding this? Simple enough, right? 
So um, you can you can think of well ac that accept order is um, some some blocking operation, right? Which waits until a customer cons comes in and places the order and also queues up the the customers, right? Or the orders more the customers. So something like a like a socket operation or so, right? So um, using threads, well, um, <coughs> very simple idea. Well, we just start um, as many threads of ex execution as we have available in our system, right? So um, on my laptop, I have four cores. So um, this would start um, four threads that just um, keep on looping, looping until um, we don't have any orders, right? Simple enough, I guess. So when when doing multi-threading program, multi-threaded programming, um, what's most important, I guess, is the scalability. And um, the thing that limits the scalability here is obviously um, the accept order, right? Where you have to have some, some kind of synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, right, so the other idea, idea would be, well, um, since we want to avoid synchronization and sharing data as much as possible, um, we just have a single thread um, that accepts the order, and then whenever an order came in, we just spawn another thread, right? So, um, who thinks this is a good idea? Depending on how expensive it is to process an order. Like so let's like yeah. let's say it's expensive enough to make spawning a thread worthwhile. <coughs> Excuse me? The biggest problem is the detach. You don't know how to exit your problem because you don't know when the other situation. Right. You need to have extra synchronization then. Uh, right. Excellent. That's that's obviously one problem. The other problem of course is um you said um depends on how how um how much it costs to, to handle the order, right? And then I'd say okay, it, it costs enough um for it to be worthwhile. To, to spawn a thread, right? But what happens if we have um, if some 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 bus um, with with tourists comes in and we suddenly have a, a thousand customers, right? So we we completely um, swamp the system with with threads, right? So <laughs> yeah, not good. So how, how could we do better? Um, I'd claim that um, we, we could do better if we compose, um, if we decompose the problem. So we have this more or less atomic block that, that um, serves the order, right? And um, if, we, if we decompose it in, into different tasks, um, we kind of would implement it in a not parallel kind of fashion, but, but concurrent kind of fashion, okay? Um, which might or might not help. Um, okay, but the problems with STD thread is well, um, you have no means to really return a result, right? <coughs> it's just executing the thread of execution. If you want to get something out, you have to have some some other means like whatever, right? And it cannot be composed easily. It's has some problems when you want to um, synchronize on on the um, on the completion of a thread, right? And it's still very low level kind of thing. So um, someone once said, um, "Raw threads are the go-to of the future." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> Which, which brings me to, to my next slide, um, back to the future, right? So um, I'd claim that um, 
future is really the abstraction that you want to use when dealing with um, multiple asynchronously, asynchronous, concurrently, or even um, par in parallel running running tasks. Right. So um, what what's really behind the future though is not is not that you just have um, STD future, but actually you have the um, concept of a producer and a consumer, right? And um, what you what you have is um, what you get is essentially um, helpers for asynchronous results. Okay, and um, you can uh, which which serves as a communication channel um, between the producer and the consumer, and um, for this to happen, you um, need a shared state, which is um, in some way or another um, reference counted, okay? So shared ownership. Um, and it can ease either transport a value or a exception, okay? This is a very simplified snippet. Don't take it literally. literally. It's just to demonstrate the purpose, right? So um, on the <coughs> producer side, um, what you do is you want to set Set a, set a value, and on the consumer side, you want to get the value, right? Um, so um, you uh, synchronize with the um, with a mutex and a condition variable, um, and you um, signal uh, empty value or exception with with a very simple enum, right? And um, that's more or less all there is to to implement such. Um, such a future um, mechanism, right? Where you have set value and get value. You obviously also want to have set exception if an exception occurred um, to, to transport the exception. Right? Okay. And the um, standard defines um, various producers and only um, two consumers. Okay, so the um, consumers are either a future or a shared future, um, with the producers um, being promise, async, or package task. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so far, so good. So um, you always have some um, some pair relations. So, for example, if you um, call std async, you get a future back. Um, if you have um, a promise object or a package task object, you have to um, retrieve the future in order to, to get the receiving channel. Um, yeah, but um, the nice thing about the future is that it's supposed to be um, better composable than um, the raw threads. Right? Um, unfortunately, that's not really true in the current incarnation of the standard. Right? Because the only way to actually um, retrieve the value or the exception is by calling a block and get, right? which suspends your current, ex uh, your current, threats, your current threat, and yeah, you, you essentially um, waste the resources in, in, on the threat. Um, the other possibility is to constantly pull the future, which isn't um, a good solution either. Right? Um, Fortunately, um, there is a concurrency technical specification um, where you have, among other things, the ability to attach continuations to a future, um, which means that you can easily um, uh, synchronize on the completion of a given task, right? And to get back to our um, to our example. Um, we can, instead of spawning a thread, we can decompose it, decompose it and asynchronously start to prepare the drink and the meal. The assumption is that they are independent of each other, hopefully. And um, then you use when all to say when both of those tasks are done, I then want to execute um, my serving, right? This again returns another future, which marks, um, which will be marked ready whenever the continuation has been executed, right? And I'd argue that this is a um, far 
um, superior um, solution um, to dealing with, with um, regular raw threats, right? Um, the pain that you might get is um, with those callbacks, right? So you easily um, get into a kind of a callback hell, right? So you really want to avoid this. Um, okay. Hmm? Excuse me? There is something, so the async works, and to tell it, I don't want to do it, I want to get rid of it. It's difficult to do it. To cancel the, the task? Yes. yes. Um, so um, the remark was that it's difficult to cancel a task. That's absolutely correct. Um, I'm not aware of any um, solution to that problem, unfortunately. So um, the closest thing that, that um, comes to my mind are um, user-defined interruption points, right? Um, where you um, just check if someone requested an interruption or cancellation, right? Um, and then an exception will get thrown to have the stack unbound, right? And if you're unlucky, the user code actually catches this ex exception <laughs> and <laughs> continues. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's that's a big that's a big problem. Um, I, 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 wanted, um, I wanted to make a programmability uh, point, though. Um, I think um, while continuations work fine, right, and let you express lots of things which you couldn't do, which you can't do with, with regular raw threads, um, it gets very cumbersome to, to write um, the continuations. And can anybody tell me the type of, of F here? <laughs> future of obviously a tuple, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> right. So it's a it's a future of a tuple of a few of two futures. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. Right. So um, no one wants really wants uh, structured bindings to the to the rescue here, right? So you don't really have to spell out anything. Um, but but still, it's it's kind of tedious and cumbersome. So when you're using async like that, um, how does it decide how many threads are actually being used? Like if I'm looking at the program that is currently running that, uh, how many threads am I going to see being run? Is it dependent on who decides that actually? That's a very good question. Um, the um, standard, uh, the the library implementation. Um, decides there. So the question is, who decides how many threads um, will I have? Who decides if I run a thread or don't run a thread? So that's a very interesting question. Um, there are different launch policies. So you have um, uh, launch sync, launch fork, um, launch deferred, and launch async. Right? And depending on the launch policy, <coughs> you have um, different semantics behind the async call, right? So launch async means you always have to start a new thread of execution, right? Whatever new thread of execution means. Okay. Right. I mean, so at least you have some control over whatever. Kind of, yeah. But the, 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 the idea really is um, you don't really want to care whether it starts a new thread or not, right? So um, it shouldn't really matter if you start um, 16 threads or a million. Okay. But unfortunately, currently, the um, implementations all start a operating system thread, which is kind of costly. Right? So, um, yeah, I mean, actually, what happens if you have your bus of customer is the same as the previous implementation? You know, you were saying that if there is a bus of many customers that come in, then you spawn a lot of threads. <laughs> Yeah. Desirable. So, the same could happen here, right? So the, qu the, the question is um, um, whether um, if, we, if we got rid of when, when a lot of customers come in and we start a lots, of, lots of threats, right? <coughs> um, no, we didn't get rid of this problem. But the library implementer could react to the, it. The library implementer could react to, which um, will be the second part of my talk. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we got rid of that. We abstracted that away. We have don't care anymore. Exactly. That's that's the point. So um, the remark was we we actually got rid of this because we um, put a layer of abstraction on top of it. 
right? So the, the only thing that matters is that um, the, the, the semantics of the async call that prepare drink and prepare meal is actually being executed in a new thread of execution, right? Um, so, um, yeah. So next slide is, um, I don't want to write those, those nasty continuations. <laughs> the coroutine technical <laughs> to the rescue, right? And um, for um, those kinds of tasks, what, what this really buys us is that it um, provides us with compiler-generated continuations, right? So instead of writing this, this nasty dot then and whatever, right, I just put this co-await in front of my futures, right? And the compiler will then hopefully generate a um, optimal continuation um, to call this serve function only once both of those features are ready. Okay. And this works pretty nicely. I can recommend um, the talks of, of Gore Nasinov, the inventor of the Gore routines, core routines. <laughs> um, really great stuff. Okay, so yeah. Um, as some of you already noted, well, um, the presented code will probably never ever scale, right? Um, it will create lots and lots of threads and we don't really have control over it. And um, in the current implementations, at least both of those more or less create operating system threads and they are costly, right? So um, they, they create a massive overhead because um, for each creation of operating system thread, you have to have a context switch into the operating system. Then the operating system has to um, allocate the, um, the thread and then switch back to your application, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this creates a massive overhead. So um, that arises from this massive overhead is, of course, to be large enough, right, in order to compensate those overheads, right? So um, as a rule of thumb, um, um, you, in order to amortize the overhead, the overheads have to be in the range of 10% of your actual useful work um, to, to kind of make sense here, right? And this means the more parallelism, the more parallelism we have on our course, the more overhead we get, this means that um, our working set needs to be large enough. This means that um, bad luck for your automo automotive application, um, for example, for, um, you don't have a large enough um, problem set. So the, the four cores that you got from, from your hardware vendor um, can't really be used because you drain in overheads, right? So too bad. So. What, what could be the solutions? Um, in the beginning, um, we had OpenMP and um, TBB mentioned, right? So um, those can be more or less classified as a solution to have a thread pool, right? Where you, where you just launch as many threads as you have threads, uh, if you have cores on your system, right? And then when um, work or task is being created, um, those are being put on on the different um, cores, right, and then executed. Um, simple function objects abstracted with uh, std function, for example, whatever, um, or in the case of TBB by subclassing, um, doesn't really matter. But the overhead really is minimized because what you end up with is um, at most the cost of a um, virtual function call, right? So approximately. So um, this should be pretty, pretty nice solution, right? But what happens if one of your tasks actually block in such a system? Can you can can you guarantee forward progress, right? I don't think so. So uh, funny story. Um, Microsoft actually implemented um, their um, STD async. Um, in one of the early versions with a thread pool with a thread limit of 256, right? If you had more, um, yeah, it, it has 
Um, yeah. Okay, so, um... Um, I'll skip this. Um, yeah, so, um, then I'll come to my... How many time do I have left? 50 minutes, okay. So, um, then I'd like to come to the second part, um, where I want to introduce um, the solution um, that I'm working on, um, which is called HPX. Um, and even Microsoft is amazed, so um, <laughs> um, Billy O'Neill is the, is the implementer of, um, of the uh, parallel standard library functions for, for the Microsoft um, standard library. And uh, when he started to implement, um, he um, explored um, the different solutions and HPX is one, one solution that implemented m implements most of the parallel um, algorithms. And um, he, well, he was amazed because um, we outperformed um, Microsoft PPL um, with all numbers. So um, the question was, dear HPX, how? So, yeah, let's see. So um, what is HPX? Um, HPX is um, a C++ standard library for concurrency and parallelism. Um, this means that we try to um, provide um, all concurrency and parallel parallelism related functionality that's defined um, in the standard that's implementable by um, with a with a library solution, um, and um, we try to continuously extend and experiment with with the new um, with the new papers that get presented, etc. And um, yeah, so what we try is to expose a coherent and uniform standards oriented API. Um, that allows you to write this, uh, those, those restaurant functions that I mentioned without actually worrying to overload the system. Right? So um, to, to enable you to write fully asynchronous task-based code using hundreds of millions of threads. Right? Um, and we extend or we try to extend um, the task launching and object model um, to uh, distributed parallelism so that you can have um, remote procedure calls for um, C++ objects. Okay, um, so we try to to write the code to run at any scale, um, meaning from so we, the smallest scale we tested on was on um, a um, <coughs> small or oh, smallish um, arm. I always get confused. 32-bit um, um, two-core ARM. Um, I forgot the actual thing. <laughs> um, Raspberry Pi something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, and the and the biggest thing um, was on um, uh, 600, 650,000 cores. So um, it's pretty nice. Um, it's open source, published under the Boost software license, so anyone can can download it. And um, we try to, so the, the way we try to, to, to tackle those problems is by having an innova uh, innovative mixture of um, those five points, where we have um, at the first point a global system-wide address space, which is important for distributed computing only, um, which is combined with um, fine-grained parallelism and lightweight synchronization, which essentially means um, when you when you do an async call inside of HPX, you don't get an operating system threat, but you get a very lightweight user level system threat. Right? HPX actually um, tries to avoid the operating system as much as possible. Right? So um, it's all completely happening in user space. Right? Um, right since I'm lacking time. So, um, as mentioned, we um, have it ported on various different platforms. Um, you can um, click on those links if you have the slides. Um, I will upload the slides later to, to GitHub um, and probably post a link on the, on the Meetup site. Um, right. And we are a uh, worldwide collaboration um, 
um, for different researchers um, to to experiment with with those kinds of systems um, to write um, massive parallel code. Okay, so um, how does it look like? Um, very briefly, um, if you run an HPX application, you can run it um, in a distributed um, memory fashion, right? Where you have um, so um, the process, so the name for a process in HPX is named locality, right? So um, you have different processes or localities, each having their own private address space, right? And of course, um, each having their own thread scheduler. So um, now I will use the, the term thread and task interchangeably, right? Because if you, um, if you recall the definition of thread of execution, Right, it just means uh, just means that um, any new thread of execution, and this also includes user-level tasks, right? And the user-level task is nothing more than a um, st stack pointer pointing to a specific stack with a um, specific um, function that's being executed on the stack, right? The only thing that's missing is um, support for thread local variables, which is kind of tricky to get right. Um, you might need compiler support for this. Um, yeah. Right. So um, on top of those um, process private um, pro um, process private address spaces, we spawn a global address space, um, and this address space is realized with something we call a parcel port and um, the active global address space service um, which does the address translation and sends out the messages or parcels via the the parcel port and parcel port is an abstraction over the um, myriads of different networking solutions that are out there right so how does it work so we have one one thread scheduler right and each thread scheduler um, has well, some amount of cores, right? Here we have um, four thread queues, uh, four queues for, for the threads, and a bunch of threads um, being piled up, right? And um, by just picking one, what happens is that um, we create a new object in the globe letter space on a given locality, right? Which returns, obviously, a future, right? And then eventually, um, the future blocks, right? We call it get. It might not be there yet, or it could be. Um, the nice thing here, due to the lightweight user level threads, what happens is that we don't have to switch back to the operating system, but to our thread scheduler and just select um, the next thread that's running on the queues, or if our queue is empty, um, look at the other queues for, for work stealing opportunities. Okay? So um, what you get in a distributed setting is um, a bunch of objects that you allocated in the globe letter space, right? And that's the um, the blue uh, the blue squares and the um, the gray squares are the um, IDs that are referencing the various objects, right? Which are globally reference counted, so you have um, shared ownership semantics and um, when you when you pass on IDs to other processes, um, you won't ever hopefully run into um, dangling references to those components, right? And um, you can have multiple references to the same object. And the other nice property is that um, those objects can be theoretically uh, can be migrated to other localities without invalidating um, the. Um, the actual original ID, right? Um, similar to migrating pages in a um, in a normal operating system. That's the question. Yeah. For the necessary system, an uh, inter-system blocking, do you use uh, an optimistic or a classic pessimistic blocking? We don't um, do anything. Um, <laughs> 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 so uh, for for inter-process locking. I mean, uh, to the global address space that we 
Okay, so the, the question is how do we synchronize the interprocess um, uh, address space? Um, the um, answer is we don't. Um, we don't pri provide coherency. Okay, it's a, it's a non coherent system. No. Um, so one, one, one of the problems that you, um, that you see almost everywhere is um, if, you, if you need to provide coherency, it's a massive scalability problem. Okay? So we just took the shortcut and say no. <laughs> it's, not a, it's, not, it's not coherent. Okay. Um, Yeah, the, 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 so the only thing that, that's coherent is that if you, if you launch a, a remote procedure call on a given object that might be migrated currently, right, um, that's something the runtime takes care of. Right? But that's only um, um, uh, for this, the synchronization is only limited to two um, communicating partners at most, well, three at most. Okay, and this can actually be modeled with um, futures. So um, inside the runtime, we eat our own dog food and implement everything on top of the um, on top of futures and stuff. <laughs> okay, um, right. Um, so uh, another nice nice uh, functionality is that you can um, register symbolic names um, for each of those objects. Okay, so um, that you can have something like a um, name resolution, uh, such that you have uh, something like a name resolution service, so you don't have to um, always pass around um, those ID types, but say, but have some kind of protocol and say, um, I have some, some, some um, partition vector, for example, and each partition is um, numbered sequentially, right? And in order to access the different partitions, I just um, calculate the index. Um, resolve the um, the ID based on the um, name and the index, and that works pretty nicely. Okay, so um, in general, it looks a little bit like uh, so. The um, architecture looks a little bit like this, um, where you have um, on top the um, C plus plus concurrency and parallelism APIs, um, which are implemented using a threading subsystem what we call local control objects, which are used for um, synchronizing. Um, so the, the nice thing is that the um, future actually works across um, processes, right? You can spawn a, if you spawn a remote task, you get a future back and um, you have um, transparent um, um, notification of completion. Um, and this is more or less um, what's behind this local control object thingy. Um, you have the um, transport layer um, where you can implement different communication libraries um, and the uh, global address resolution. And um, on top of that, we have a um, performance counter framework which is able to actually um, collect all the various metrics and counters um, that might happen in the system, um, which <coughs> can then be used to dynamically adapt the behavior of the runtime to, for example, avoid. Um, too much oversubscription. How do you guarantee for forward progress? How do we guarantee for forward progress? Um, we guarantee for forward progress um, in the way that um, we provide our own synchronization primitives. Okay, so you should not um, use um, blocking calls inside HPX threads. If you do, we can't guarantee forward progress. But um, once you use the HPX provided primitives, um, which suspend the HPX threads instead of something else, right? Then you um, automatically get the forward progress guarantee through the thread of execution definition. Yeah. But that extends to atomics. Um, atomics are never blocking. Uh, yeah. Okay. I take I take this back. Uh, atomics are not supposed to be blocking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Probably mostly like mutexes and like uh, lock out. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't implement the non-lock free atomics on top, but uh, contributions welcome. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. So why yeah. don't you support this? Because uh, a network interconnects, well, may do it for free, right? So like in Philippe, they support atomic operations across the network. So do you, do you support something like Infinity or MPI because they provide all the atomic Yes. Um, they do. Um, no, we currently don't support atomics across the network. Um, and, uh, so the question was if we support um, atomics provided by something like Libfabric or MPI. Um, um, the answer is no. Um, that's currently on our list of things to do. So the first thing will be to actually expose um, the RDMA things, right? So that's that you can uh, pre-allocate buffers and then um, Effect, uh, if efficiently use the RDMA um, communication um, provided by those interfaces. And um, once we have this, atomics could be supported as well. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no. But the, the question that, that um, Lucas had was more like the STD atomics on a single node system, right? And the problem there is that some atomics are not lock free, right? Um, especially those, or most often those that don't fit in a word of your processor. So you um, kind of need um, other synchronization mechanisms to make the specific operations atomic again. Okay. Um, but no, yeah. Okay, so um, how much time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Do you have questions? <laughs> 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 what kind of accelerators do you use? Um, <laughs> or what about you support? CUDA and CUDA. Um, so um, we have um, two approach. So the, the question was um, what kind of accelerators we support. Um, the answer is um, uh, OpenCL and CUDA, and we are working on um, supporting HSA-based accelerators um, as well, and cycle-based um, accelerators. Um, but currently, so um, this stuff currently works on um, on CUDA devices, um, where you can use the um, parallel algorithms, um, in the, depending on the policy, um, and execute execute depending on the policy where um, the uh, function will be run on, right? How do you implement parvec? Like, do you do instruction level vectorization? Um, we started it. There's the possibility to, to do this. So the most obvious choice would be to reuse the OpenMP um, pragmas, right? But they have um, problems with C++ code. So um, um, we're still looking into how to um, how to make this possible. I know that the Intel Parallel Standard Library implementation does have um, uh, vectorization support. Okay, uh, one solution we have for this is um, the um, data par thing. I d I'm not sure if you if you heard it. So data par is essentially kind of a um, well competing solution to parvec, I, I'd guess, um, where um, instead of some implementation magic, um, the, um, the input sequence is compiled or, or transformed by metaprogramming magic, which can be provided by the library, into SIMD types. And then you can actually use um, the um, uh, SIMD parallelism inside your bodies. And that's using the VC library from, from Matthias Kretz, who also proposed this. Could you see it being a compiler's job to generate those instructions? But then he would need your library and to know your library. Um, I'm not sure if it's even possible. I, I, I don't know if it's possible um, that the compiler is able to see through all this. So. Um, our first attempt was, I mean, you, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the OpenMP stuff. Right, so what you can do in OpenMP is um, in front of a loop, you can um, 
write um, a pragma OMP vectorize, I think, something. Um, and then you tell the compiler, hey, we don't have any data dependencies or whatsoever, just vectorize this thingy. Right? Especially with iterators and references and pointers and whatnot, the compiler often gets confused about data dependencies, and that's the biggest issue. And you c if, you, if you start from, from a high level like this, and try to boil it down such that the compiler is able to understand it, that's kind of a tough problem. And you need some support from the compiler to do this. Okay. Can you kind of coexist with other um, parallelization libraries? Like, I have a bunch of uh, parallelized code with PPL, for example. <coughs> Could In theory, yes. Uh, <coughs> um, the question is: the question is, can PPL coexist? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, to 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 answer your question, um, so what we um, do by default is we just take control over your system. Okay. We use <laughs> no, uh, the, not not in not in the bad way. Um, <laughs> we just we just start a, a busy waiting loop on all of your cores, right? And your CPU utilization will immediately go to 100 percent. Okay. If you don't do anything else, um, what you can do, however, is you can control the binding of your of the operating system threads and how many. The they do exactly the same. Right. And that that's the biggest problem, right? All all others do exactly the same. Right. Um, so there are two questions. Uh, do you run on uh, any operating system less uh, environment, like providing your own vanilla scheduler, or uh, not using uh, operating services to create threads, but you go bare metal the cores? So the the question was if we provide uh, if we if we run on um, systems without operating, uh, without operating systems, so bare metal systems. Um, currently not. Um, but it. So essentially, we run on every device that implements STD thread, and dynamic memory allocation and exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> For everything else, um, I'm pretty sure that it's possible, um, but it requires work. Okay, but in the end, it will be it would be a very interesting topic, right? Because one one big problem, for example, or well, maybe not big, but but a problem in some instances is that those user level tasks are non-preemptive, right? So you can't stop them at any point in time and if you run on a bare metal system right you don't have any security protection and you might be able to just preempt those threats and um, and implement better um, scheduling decisions um, suppose we have now like a very large distributed vector um, is there a mechanism to query the system which part of the vector is loaded in my yeah. wherever I am so because then I can have a native pointer to some other specialized libraries which are not necessarily from a cheap HPX, but let's say it's a late in KL or something like that. So the question is whether it's possible to um, know where given partitions of a large distributed vector are. Um, the answer is yes. So uh, one simple solution would be that you just call a remote procedure call on your on, on one of your partitions, right? This action is exactly executed where your data is. So if you if you have it as a as a member function, for example, you can immediately access the um, the members of your object without any 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 hassle, without any other mechanisms. Last question. Yeah. Um, how do you use network partitions? Um, we currently don't. We don't take network topologies into account so far. Um, um, my answer, so the question was how do we deal with network partitions? So uh, my answer to that would be um, that's the job of your batch scheduler to place your application. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, we don't do this currently. Um, but um, this would be a very interesting research topic, yeah. 
Thanks.